Well, hey everyone, and welcome back to another week here on the Foundry Church YouTube channel. We're so glad that you guys came to see what God is doing in and through his church. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, the best way to do so is to like us on Facebook. We post all sorts of information there. And don't forget that there's an audio version of this message on Apple Podcasts. Just search the Foundry Church. With that said, let's dive into our Advent series called Expecting. To Joseph. Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a son. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Since I am a virgin. Did you hear about Mary's condition? Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Mary, Mary, I believe you. The angel told me not to be afraid to take you home as my wife. What is conceived in you is from the Holy Spirit. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. For us the child is born, to us the son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. The Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the Roman world, and everyone went to his own town to register. The Roman governor's soldiers took Jesus to the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in clothes, and she placed him in a manger. They stripped Jesus, and they wrapped him in a scarlet robe, and they placed a crown of thorns on his head. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today, in the town of David... A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in clothes and laying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to man on whom his favor rests. They put a staff in his right hand, and they knelt before him, and they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spit on him and took the staff and they struck him on the head again and again. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's hurry, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And when the soldiers had mocked him, they took off the scarlet robe, they put his clothes back on him and they led him out to crucify him. In the middle of the night, the shepherds hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. In the middle of the day, darkness 
came over the whole land until about three in the afternoon. And then Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then Jesus breathed his last. And when the shepherds had seen Jesus, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. And those who passed by him hurled insults, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days, come down off this cross and save yourself. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood in front of Jesus on the cross saw how he died, he said to himself, surely this man was the son of God. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Near the cross of Jesus Christ stood Mary, the mother of Jesus. We don't often think of Christmas in terms of Easter. But the reality is, if you don't think of the birth of Christ and that manger with a shadow of the cross hanging over it, you actually miss the full perfection of the gift. There is a perfection in the gift when you see the manger and the reality of that beautiful, serene image of the Christ child, lowly and small, in a little barn with his teenage mother, her fiancé, Joseph, doing their best just to survive the night. When you see it best, you see it with a shadow of a cross. I don't know if you've picked up on it, but there is the manger here on the backdrop and the shadow hanging over it. That was an intentional part of this series. In that everything we do, what we are expecting, maybe God sees a little differently. Would you pray with me? God, as we uh, plumb into your word and we look deeply into what you have to say about Christmas, about the gift you gave, I pray that you would just humble our hearts, take out of us all that we think we know and pour into us the fullness of you who know, of you, God, who know and desire to speak a word to your church May our ears be open, even as you speak in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I have a question. You got to help me out here. Who here has somebody in their family that no matter how perfect it is, the gift you give them, they ask this question, is there a gift receipt? We know them, right? No matter if you get everything on their list, the last thing with a dagger lace smile is, is there a gift receipt? Meaning, Yeah, I'm not keeping this. And it hurts. Like, it really hurts. It's amazing. Like, these people, the gift receivers, um, they they have this way of holding it up. Oh, this sweater, it's beautiful. I love it. Deep in the heart, it actually is translated, don't get comfortable in my hands, you'll be back at Macy's before 8 a.m. Right? Anybody? You know these people or are you those people? For shame if you are, because we pour time and effort into these gifts. And when you look at it, you're like, oh, that's great. Is there a gift receipt? Can I get what I really wanted? Is there some other way? Well, anybody ever watch the show, Everybody Loves Raymond? Yeah, oh, it's such a brilliant show. I loved it so much. On in the 90s and early 2000s. And um, one of the great things they did in this show was the beloved son, Raymond, was terrible at Christmas. And he would try really hard with his parents and he'd just mess it up. Like one year he got him fruit of the month, which is hilarious, because his mom came over and she's like, somebody just delivered pears to our house. What is that? And he's like, oh, that's your Christmas. We got you fruit of the month. And she's like, but I already have fruit. I don't want pears. He's like, well, don't worry. Next month it'll be oranges. And she's like, they're bringing more? I don't want what If I want oranges, I'll buy them. He's like, mom, it's fruit of the month. What is going on? The dad says, we don't need fruit. And they start arguing and fighting, and in the end, it seems like the fruit is stalking this precious old couple with knives in their hands, right? They're like, they're like chasing them, and they feel frustrated. Raymond tries to make it right one year by getting them a toaster. They open the toaster, and the mom says, we already have a toaster. The dad says, didn't you make me toast this morning? What do we need that for? I don't know. He got us a toaster. What's going on? We don't, you know we have a toaster, and he's going, it's special. And they're like, it's fine. Never mind. We'll, we'll take care of it. Just thanks for the toaster. And he's like, oh. They return it only to find out he had had it engraved 
with the grandkids' names, which I don't know why you put grandkids' names on a toaster, but that was the storyline. And then they spend the whole episode trying to find this toaster they had returned. And the reality behind this is quite true of us. Sometimes you and I have something we so desperately want or desperately deeply locked in our mind that we really super want badly that we can't see beyond our, beyond our own expectations and desires. We're blinded to the things that might even be better than what we had expected. The fulfilled, well, the best way to kind of say this is the expectations that the people of God had, the Jewish people, were fulfilled in Christ. The fulfilled expectations. But here's the thing. It wasn't what they were looking for. When Matt uh, taught the other week and he unpacked for us this idea of mighty God, did an excellent job with that and showing how God will move, answer our prayers in unexpected ways. And he is mighty God, but he does this on his terms, not ours. And I will tell you this, because of the history of the Jewish people, they had an idea for what Messiah was going to be. See, there was this covenant between Abram, Abraham and God. And God said he would give him a son and descendants as numerous as the sands of the sea. But he also said he would give him a land, a covenant land. And that was central to the promise. It's central to the people of Israel even today. The land is the promised land. It's very important. And it was this thing that um, they they had an expectation that the Messiah would be kind of like Moses who came on the scene early in the covenant and he kind of, by the power of God, routed the Pharaonic uh, Egyptian empire, led them out of slavery, got them into the promised land and all was well. But I think that there is a truth in this promise of a covenant land, but I think it's actually, if you look just a layer deeper, it's kind of fascinating. If you read the promise of God giving a covenant land when he says in Genesis 2, 7, that he took the dust of the earth and he formed it into man and he breathed the breath of God into it. And you begin to realize that God's purposes really didn't have anything to do with the land as much as it had to do with redeeming those who bore his image, his people, us who are made but of dust, right? Right? And you begin to see the texture and the layers of what God's promises meant. But to the Israelite, the Jewish people, they just wanted somebody to come and put the wood to Rome. They wanted Rome kicked out. They wanted a mighty king, a warrior, and this whole Prince of Peace thing wasn't going to jive. Remember Isaiah chapter 9. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Today, we look at the much unexpected prince of peace. He fulfills all the expectations, but they just weren't, he fulfills all the promises, but maybe doesn't meet their expectations. And you and I wrestle with this too, don't we? We have disappointment in our lives when bad things happen to good people, when good people suffer, when there are wars and rumors of wars and brokenness. We even see it in the song that was, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. The line straight out of the song is, in despair I hung my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. Because he's looking at the circumstantial evidence of reality. The guy who wrote that poem was living in the Civil War just at the end of the Civil War era in America. And his wife had recently died. His son, a veteran of the Civil War, had been shot through the neck and was paralyzed. And he penned that letter because his, well... His expectations were dashed, but we kind of feel that way too, don't we? When we look out and we see hatred and bigotry and injustice and people marginalized and harmed and put into like horrible situations, when we see how there is harm and famine and hurt all over this world, we can look and say, God, how is this the peace that was promised us in the Messiah? But that's us just looking at our circumstances like the Israelites looking at their land. We're missing something deeper. We're missing that maybe God gave us the perfect gift, the perfect gift in Jesus Christ. And what we have to do is maybe look just a little bit deeper 
than our circumstances. And don't get me wrong, I get circumstances can be hard. I face them myself, my friends, my wife, my kids. They know how I react to those circumstances. It's a hard part of life. But what do we do with the perfect gift? This kind of, I think we love the semi-serene nature of the manger setting. Little barn, young lady, fiance, cattle lowing. Donkey, shaggy brown, wise men, gold, frankincense, myrrh. We like it, don't we? It kind of has this nice echoey feel to it. It has this, I don't know, it evokes something out of us. We look at it and we say, ooh, you know, we like that gift. We like the serenity of it. We like how it kind of feels on the surface. But do we ever take time to go beyond the idyllic image in our mind and get into the reality of who Jesus is, of who Jesus Christ is, even in the manger, who he was destined to become, that he would grow into a man who would be betrayed, wrapped in a scarlet robe, and the peace that you and I earnestly desire and want and long for, and we long for it. Look at all the ways we kind of compensate and medicate our own souls with all the, you know, honestly, all the consumerism and the how I feel and the me first kind of mentality that we have. We seek this peace, and the peace we earnestly desire was one for us in a manger that had a cross shadowing it. The Christ child under the shadow of the cross because our peace would be one in his agony. Our peace would be one in his obedience. 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah penned these words. He said it this way. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The, the punishment that brought us peace was laid upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. He's describing the death of the Messiah. He's prophetically describing what God would do to bring you and I peace in this life. And that peace is not rooted in our circumstances. Remember the words of Jesus. In this world, you will have trouble. You are going to have a tough time, but take heart. I've overcome this world. Look a little deeper and see the thing I've done. So what do we see in this perfect gift? What does the perfect gift give us, even though sometimes our circumstances on the top don't change? What is there down below? What is the deeper kind of truth hiding in this covenant? And it's this. Our separation from God has been healed. It may not sound like much on the surface, but dig around in there a little. Genesis 2-7, I just mentioned it. He formed us from the dust. He put into us the breath of God. He put into you and to me the purposes of God. He put into us the very purposes and plans and giftedness of God. He wove you together in your mother's womb. This perfect gift would reconnect us with our heavenly father. There was a chasm that kept us from God. And because of that manger, because of the shadow of the cross hanging over it, Jesus, in his life, death, and resurrection, we see the chasm bridged. Our purpose realized because our hearts can finally be whole again. And you may be sitting there going, I don't need Jesus. I don't need to be whole again. I'm fine. That's a lie. Don't deceive yourself. You may be comfortable in the moment, but face one traumatic crisis and find out just how fine you are when you're not whole in your being, in your deep inside, when there's no peace deep inside, when your circumstances turn to trouble and war and you're sitting here going, what do I do with this? And you're not fine anymore. I know a lot of people in this happy little burg of West Michigan, and trust me, I've lived in a lot of places in America, and I've been to a lot of places in the world. This is Pleasantville. We live a nice little community here, and I love Zealand. It's a great place, right? It's a really good place. But the reality for you and I, quite frankly, is that many of us in here don't have peace, we don't have peace. And you're like, I don't know why. I do the right things. I go to church on Sunday. If I'm a super Christian, I even go at night somewhere other than the foundry because they don't do night service, pagans. And, um, 
And like, I do that. My kids go to all the programs. I, you know, we do all the things we should. Why don't I know peace? Why don't I have peace in my life? Why is everything kind of deeply, and why am I always striving on the inside? And then on the opposite spectrum, you have people like Deet Iman and Corey Ten Boom, who lived under the jackboot of the Third Reich, who were protecting Jewish people in World War II, and they were being persecuted, crushed, and harmed for the protection they provided other people. And they did all they could within their power, lost loved ones, and they had this traumatic experience. And all in all, they would say they had a deep, abiding peace. Why do we live in a time of peace but not know it? And they lived in a time of deep turmoil and knew it. It's because they got down to something deeper. They found their identity not in their circumstances. They found it in their unity with their creator. And when we look at that, we can realize the peace that matters comes from one thing, the forgiveness of our sins. The forgiveness of our sins because in the agony of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, he cries out the psalm, Psalm 22. Jesus cries that out and his cry, we need to know that haunting, horrible cry of Jesus that comes out of his mouth should have been yours and it should have been mine. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Do you get the fullness of the gift? We no longer have to fear crying, my God, my God, why am I without you? In hell, in eternity, we are called back to him because the full wrath of God was poured out on Jesus Christ and the punishment that brought you and I peace was the wrath of God poured onto our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The gift of Christmas is in the life that would be lived, clean and spotless, the death that would be died obediently and willingly on your behalf and my behalf, that not one of us would ever cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How much better a gift could there be So for you and I knowing that all that matters is the forgiveness of sins, we need to be forgiven We need to be forgiven to bridge the divide between us and God. And you may be like, Eric, you don't know how bad of a person I am. I know, but I know how bad I am. And Jesus still saved me. He saved me and he'll save you. The reality is quite frank. There will be no peace physically, spiritually, and emotionally for you or for me unless we accept in totality the gift of Jesus Christ, his birth, life, death, and resurrection. We can't get Jesus light in this world. Where you're like, yeah, it's not like, you know, going to McDonald's. I'll have salvation with no discipleship and 2% giving and never volunteer. That seems Christian-ish. I'll take that and get out of hell. That's just not Christian faith. Christian faith is an all-in thing. It becomes who we are because it reconnects us with the one who we had lost in sin. We had lost the connection to the one who had formed us, the one who had made us. We realize who we are in Christ because Christ connects us to our heavenly Father. There will be no peace apart from that. So we have to understand that until this gospel is preached in every ear that occupies this globe, there will be no peace on earth on the surface. But the Christians and the church will know peace. We'll know peace deep in our spirits and we'll live with a peace that lives above our circumstances. Our peace is stronger than our circumstances. And trust me, circumstances get dark in a hurry, don't they? Things can go bad really quick and we're found grieving, lost, and and hurting. But if our circumstances don't hold you know, like our fate, but if God holds our future, our giftedness, our purposefulness, everything takes on meaning. The gift of Jesus Christ is that we no longer endure the punishment for our sins. We get the relationship with our Heavenly Father. So these three words really sum up the gift. It is finished. Jesus Christ hanging on the cross called out, it is finished. Once and for all, your sin and my sin is reconciled before God if we would simply lay it before him and give it 
to Jesus. Seems like a terrible offering to give, but all he wants is to take and move it as far as the east is from the west in your life and my life. Don't return this perfect gift. Don't go looking for the gift receipt for your faith because God didn't meet your expectations or there's good people who suffer. That's part of this life. We do have trouble in it, but take heart, my friends. Jesus Christ is Lord of all creation. He remains God of all creation. And I love the hope that is bound up in that. I love the promise that is given to us in that, that God Almighty became a baby who lived inside the womb of a 14 to 16 year old girl and was nursed at her breast and raised up dependent on her. Think of that for a minute. Let's put this in context. 14, 15 year old single mom with her fiance carpenter husband, right? Traveling through Roman Judea on a donkey, or walking. There's that image of Jesus. And then there's the creation image of Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and by him all things were made. Nothing that is made apart from him was made. So what it's saying is, in the beginning, Jesus was the Word of creation, the very first Word. We call Jesus the light of the world, don't we? What is the first Word of creation? Let there be light. And I guarantee you, the name of Jesus is echoing off the halls of our universe, even still today, because he is the first Word of creation. And he saw fit to reduce himself into that little girl's life and be raised up, and die your death. It's a pretty good gift. Why would we want a gift receipt on that? He became sin. He became everything God had to turn away from. He became sin who knew no sin. He was hung on a criminal's cross so that you could have peace, maybe not in your circumstances, but in your life. You could have peace that God's purposes in your life will not be overtaken. His purposes and plans will remain. Never forget that in the serene image of the Christ child, there is an eternal reality of God with us. God who didn't see us from afar and just disregard us, but God who came near, a Jesus who experienced every rejection you've ever felt, every heartache you've ever known, every sorrow, every loss. Jesus knows it. What a gift. Don't ever forget God with us because this baby was born to save the human, con- the human race. The, the dirt that bore the image. God's fulfilling the land contract in your life and in my life, but he's not done yet because there's a world who needs to know. The peace we seek is quite simply found in that now we have peace with God. We have peace with the one in whom we find our identity, our purpose, The word in Hebrew is shalom. You hear it once in a while. Shalom's not like good times. Shalom is this deep, connected to your soul piece that says regardless of what what goes on, it is well. It is well with my soul, regardless of my circumstances. Doesn't mean you don't weep. Doesn't mean you don't grieve. It just means this. My circumstances don't have the final say on my hope. Amen? Amen? My circumstances don't have the final say on our hope. In the stable fell the shadow of a cross. And in the shadow of the cross, if you listen closely, the fulfillment of the promise of peace has come to this world. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we love you. And we thank you for who you are. And today, God, we just, we just ask that you would help us Uh, Just be mindful that you came. You're here with us. Mystery of mysteries and wonders of wonders. You, Lord Jesus, came, you lived, you died, and you rose again. And then you sent your Holy Spirit, and you are here with us by your Holy Spirit, convicting and transforming us, broken people, into the image of you, the high exalted Lord of creation. So today we just celebrate the hope that here with us is Emmanuel the God who came near, the God who knows our sufferings, the God who knows our purposes, our giftings, the God who speaks the language of our calling into service in the kingdom. Oh God, give us courage to answer the call in Jesus' name. Amen. There's only one gift. 
that I, that I long for. I think that, I, I don't want to say I, that we um, at the Foundry Church, if you're a member here, if you're on staff here, whatever you do here, our singular focus, our, everything in the crosshairs for us is this, that you know Jesus Christ, not as some religious relic that can get you out of trouble, but as your Lord and Savior, one who knows you completely and loves you just the same. And may that gift be yours in this Christmas season. May you bear with you the hope that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. May you have that gift and take it and share it with the world around you. If you don't know Jesus Christ, if you've fallen away from Jesus Christ, make no mistake, just come up. I would love to pray with you and introduce you to him. I would love to share with you the gospel that I know to be true. Our joy and our hope is that maybe somehow one or two in this place will know him, that all of us will receive him in some way as the gift in totality from the manger to the resurrection, that we would know him and then live with such a joy and confidence that his plans and purposes in your life and in my life are not under dispute. They are simply in process. God is working out his ever-perfect plan in your life for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen? May you go from this place and really just have the greatest Christmas ever. I just hope, We hope you have the best Christmas celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, the blessing of family, friends, and may you know the peace of Christ in your life in this season. And as you go from this place, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Merry Christmas, my friends. Have a great night. Hey, thanks for joining us for this week's message. If you're looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's, what you can do is you can click the link below in the description and that'll take you to our weekly devotions page. Devotions are a crucial part of what we call our weekly rhythm here at the Foundry, so make sure you check that out. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope to see you again next week.